This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. Are you ready to discover your True North Story? With your hosts, Tama Fulton and John Hudson Masserol. Hello. Hey, is this Ian? This is Ian. Hi, Ian. You guys are an amazing group. Your music is incredible. Your voices blend so well together. And I know that three out of four of you who are singing are related. So maybe for folks who aren't familiar with Delta Ray, you could just let us know who you are. That is so nice. First of all, thank you so much. Delta Ray is a 60s band. We're from North Carolina. We are six best friends, three siblings. We like to tell stories in four-part harmony. <laughs> we were born in the South, uh, my brother and I in North Carolina, Britt in Tennessee. And then our dad's job kind of moved us around, so we uh, were in Marietta, Georgia for six years and then um, moved out to the San Francisco Bay Area. And that is where we met Liz Hopkins um, when I was 11 years old. And we have been really close friends ever since and have been singing together very shortly after meeting and have always loved Liz's voice. She's always been an extremely close friend of all of ours. Um, My brother and I went back to North Carolina to go to college. And after we had all graduated, we reached out to Liz and Britt and asked if they would be interested in joining a band. And we started it out in the woods, Durham, North Carolina, out in kind of a ramshackle fixer-upper house. We've just been touring ever since, and we met our drummer and bass player. They're both North Carolina natives there, um, Mike and Grant. Yeah, we've been a band for about eight years. You are great at storytelling, too. And Ian, I know that that you are a lover of story and reading. I got to hear a little bit about some of your songwriting and how it stems from story. Tell us a little bit about the genre of country and how story plays such an incredible role. You know, I think country music today and historically has a unique place in kind of its love of great storytelling and it's always been a really lyrical genre even more so these days i think that the emphasis on great lyrics and storytelling distinguishes it from other genres for me when i was in seventh grade my dad read me a passage from a book by pat conroy called beach music and it was one of these epic deeply emotional adventure family stories and I just fell in love, and I, you know, that book is meant for adults. My my mom gave me a copy, and she had paper clipped certain pages together that I was not to read because <laughs> they had content in them, which meant, of course, those were the parts that I read first. And uh, of course, <laughs> a bunch of those kinds of books when I was pretty young, and it has led to a love of kind of southern literature and that type of storytelling being woven into songs. And when I was 23 years old, I had an opportunity to go to work as a caretaker for a Southern author named Reynolds Price. He was a professor of mine at Duke, taught English, and he had been in a wheelchair for about 25 years when I met him as a result of uh, radiation therapy that saved his life from spinal cancer, but also left him paraplegic. And so I became an assistant to him, and that year of living with a tremendous storyteller and writer really cemented my love of of Southern writing. I've kind of been endeavoring to tell stories through my songwriting ever since. That's amazing. Tam and I were so blessed to have a couple of really great Southern writers on True North Story, Greg Isles and John Hart, who is a fellow North Carolinian who I guess is now living in Virginia. What is it about the South and narratives? It seems like that there's something woven into the fabric of the culture or society there that lends itself to storytelling. Well, I, I totally agree with you, and I actually have gifted uh, some of John Hart's books to family members, but have never read his stuff myself, so this is the perfect impetus okay. for me to do that. But I completely agree with you. I think that there is something woven into fabric of the culture of the South that really does support storytelling. And Reynolds always used to say that he thought second only to shelter and food and water 
was storytelling to its kind of essentialness to the human soul. I mm-hmm. really think that there's something to that, and especially in the South, where it's just a it's a place with a lot of history. I mean, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of beauty and natural beauty, and I, that to me what always gets kind of woven into. Uh, great Southern writing is tales of family tragedy, but also how family and magic and charm of the South bolsters people and and helps them to grow even in the midst of a lot of pain. And that's really what I identified. I'm like wondering how much of that pain maybe drives some of that storytelling, you know, that it comes out of that. And it's not just one specific ethnic group, like the whole thing. And it's everyone that exists in this culture that have experienced different things. Like, to your point, good and bad, it's become part of who they are. I I don't know. I mean, I grew up in Chicago, but I lived in Atlanta for 20 years. And so I've seen both cultures, and there's definitely a power, a spiritual sense woven into into storytelling and narratives and words and and music and, and things like that in the South that doesn't exist other places. And we're all grappling with it. I mean, we're all trying to make sense of it within our own histories and, you know, moving forward and trying to do better for the future generations and really inspired by, you know, in the works of people like Pat Conroy and William Styron is they go to these huge themes, you know, whether it's the Holocaust or slavery in the South, they're not afraid of them, and they confront them head on, and it is the source of a lot of pain, and it is the source of a lot of guilt for white Southerners, and it is the source of a lot of internal conflict and having to come to terms with things, and these writers, they take it on, and they find ways, I I think, struggle with it, and just embrace that it isn't, you know, that they're, that's the beauty of of a novel, is over the course of five to seven hundred pages, you can really tease out all of the deep and conflicting emotions about it. And I find I find that really admirable because it doesn't lend itself to simple answers. And I think that I it's a challenge to do it in three and a half minutes in a song, but melody and uh, instrumentation can help do is lend, you know, fill in some of the pieces that that don't get fed with words. Ian, you told a lovely story of how you wove the titles of some of your favorite Southern writers' books into this song. <laughs> did goodbye to uh, the last living grandparent in my family uh, this past weekend. And uh, it was a hard, a really hard thing to to do and to kind of come to terms with. And I've been thinking about my, what we called our grandmother, Mama Ma, for, you know, I've been thinking about her a lot this past week because we really owe our southernness to her and her first husband, my grandfather. When they moved down from Ohio and Pennsylvania to North Carolina to go to school at Duke, that's where they met and fell in love. They stayed there so my grandfather could become a neurosurgeon at Duke. And so my mom ended up going to Duke as well. My dad got a wrestling scholarship there from Baltimore. They met, fell in love, stayed in North Carolina, had my brother and I, and then started moving. And my brother and I came back to school to go to Duke, and that is where I met my wife. And so we just have this legacy that I owe to my grandparents. When I went to work for this author, uh, Reynolds Price, one of the things that I was um, incredibly blown away to learn was that he had known my grandfather and that my grandfather had stepped in on occasion when when his primary doctor was not available to help assist Reynolds care. So I think that's part of what happens in small towns like Durham is you get these incredibly interwoven stories. And so, yeah, so this song, A Long and Happy Life, an homage to my favorite Southern writers, and I did weave into the lyrics for my favorite book titles, The Water is Wide and Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy, uh, Lie Down in Darkness by William Siren, and my friend Reynolds, friend and teacher Reynolds, his first book was called A Long and Happy Life, and that's the name of our song. Think of it as also just a, as dedicated to the love between imperfect people and the beautiful things that it can generate. That's, that's where it came from.
And then the whole EP is called A Long and Happy Life as well. And we're really excited about it. So, Brittany, I'm sure that you were probably the kid that got teased and, and rolled up in rugs and sat on and tickled and all that by the older brothers. And then you decided to go back and join a band with them. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Um, you really nailed it. Were you there? <laughs> yes, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I uh, I think that there was a, from childhood to now, a lot has changed in terms of our sibling dynamic. My brothers were pretty classic older brothers in that they did tease me and I never did get rolled up in any rugs that I can remember. But um, <laughs> I actually really appreciated having two older brothers because I think it toughened me up. Early on in life, I had a, just a, my own soundtrack, which was Ian and Eric's original music. So I kind of steered clear of writing any music. I love to perform and was in a lot of musicals and choirs and and also developed other interests. But when Ian and Eric were graduating from Duke, and I just so happened to be graduating from college at the same time, um, happenstance, they invited me to join this band with Liz, who has always been like a big sister to me. And for any little siblings who are listening, I think you can imagine it's like all of your FOMO that you've ever felt, fear of missing out, um, <laughs> suddenly satisfied. <laughs> Because your big brothers and big sister are saying, hey, will you come, not just will you come play with us, which is like the childhood desire being fulfilled, but will you come work with us and create something magical and amazing and live with us and um, be our partner? And I think just that recognition of kind of that I'd come into my own, we'd all grown up and reach an, reach an age of real sort of quality and, and friendship was special enough to pull me out of whatever else I was thinking I might do for a career or a life and say, yeah, that can all wait. I'd love to be in this band with my family. So it was it was also a chance to move back to the South because I was also drawn to the magic and, and history there. It's been surreal. That's something I was going to ask both of you, Ian and Brittany, was this something that you always just knew or when did the light bulb go off that music and singing and songwriting was going to play a major role in your purpose personally? Well, I think we've had really different paths with that. For me, it was a childhood dream to, to sing and be what I like to call a pop star. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't know at the time when I was younger what I sort of meant by that, but my love of Spice Girls and <laughs> Christina Aguilera and Destiny's Child fueled my dreams. Until I got to an age, you know, where I felt like the rubber was going to hit the road and I needed a plan. And I think for a lot of people, that's what happens, that, that music sort of presents itself as as your first love and your passion. But the harsh reality of the world makes it seem like an impossibility. So I was actually on my uh, trajectory toward another very lucrative line of work which is farming. So I was... Uh, like driving a tractor I mean, and like plowing fields and planting and reaping and sowing and all that? Yes, I never really did get up to tractor level because I was working on small scale organic farms, but okay. certainly uh, doing everything by hand and kind of the old fashioned way. It was very much manual labor, labor, which is still totally my form of meditation and release. But when when something like music becomes a real opportunity, I hope people grab it because it's not often that it does. And I knew that doing anything with my brothers, we were going to do it full tilt because they don't really do anything half <laughs> I think for them, they always knew that it would be their lives. At least a couple of you started out maybe wanting to be educators or had some experience doing teaching before going into music full time. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing that up because our bandmates who are not on this uh, podcast at the moment are bass player, Grant, our drummer, Mike, and um, the other female vocalist, Liz Hopkins, all were actually either acting as educators or set to become you know, full-time teachers later in life. Mike and Grant were music teachers um, in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina, and Liz was an assistant teacher at bilingual preschool. Uh, her mom also was, a, was an educator, so I think Liz had her mom to look up to. Um, she was a teacher and then became the principal of Liz's middle school. So Liz has always had a huge love and respect for teachers, and, and I think that's 
a big part of why we, we actually started a program called Tickets for Teachers to give away free tickets to teachers so that they can have a night of music and also um, the opportunity for their students to nominate them. Teachers are sort of unsung heroes in a lot of ways. And I just think that this program is amazing where students can nominate a teacher to come to see a Delta Ray concert. Do they do that on your website? Is that how it's getting started? Yeah, it's, uh, they can nominate on our website, deltaray.com, delta com, or they can go to our Facebook or our Instagram, which is just at Delta Ray or Twitter at Delta Ray and nominate their teacher and tell a story of why this teacher has been an amazing part of their lives. And it can be a student who nominates them. It can be a, a teacher within your community that you nominate just because you know the great work that they're doing. It can be your husband or wife if they're a teacher and they work long hours every day. And uh, It can be yourself if you're a teacher. You love Del Rey or you love music and you love night off and to give themselves a night off, that kind of self-care. It's really also about the stories because um, those stories, if you share them on social media, are public. This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. And now, back to the program. Just footsteps on the stairs. Whispers in the silence. Remind me you're not there. There's no peace in quiet. There's no peace. I was curious, we had a a previous podcast guest, country singer, songwriter, James Otto, and he was talking a lot about Nashville and about writing music, and this kind of goes back to Ian's earlier point, which I'm really encouraged to hear him talk about writing songs, telling stories through music. Do you guys feel that that is something that is kind of being lost in today's modern music, is the ability to tell stories through song? I think that uh, in today's modern music, there's a you know a, just a broad array of things going on. Um, you know, on the pop side of things, with EDM, some of the more you know kind of production focused stuff, yeah. sure, a little less storytelling because the emphasis is on you know hyper catchy melodies and big anthemic repeated phrases. I think that country music, rap, hip hop, and you know occasional instances of kind of folk pop hybrids like Hozier, they are still really doing great storytelling. And I actually think that there, in some ways there's more great storytelling happening uh, than ever before. But at the same time, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard because like throughout history, you get certain decades of music distilled into the best that happened when we reference it <laughs> in our memories. So for instance, like you think of the 60s and all the great storytelling that happened there. But when you think of the 60s, you really think of the best that came out of it. And, you know, listening right. to, like, Bob Dylan's Hurricane the other day, you know, that level of storytelling, very hard to come by. But then again, that is representative of the best that came out of an era. And so I think, I think that I think our generation will have examples of that level of storytelling. And I think that there's a resurgence in country music uh, from songwriters and artists like Ashley Monroe and Cam and... Uh, Maren Morris and Brothers Osborne and you know a lot of new stuff that's coming out to Chris Stapleton and Charlie Worsham and there's just there are a lot of great artists that are telling really poignant stories and are lyrically genius and I, I think that, that that's something that's still got a really healthy through line from the early roots of you know country and folk music. I agree with you I think you have to look for it a little bit more, but it's but it's out there. It's in pockets, and which is good. It's not so controlled by the large music companies that are pushing huge marketing budgets behind certain bands. But and I get what you're saying about the the um, catchy, poppy, a million download kind of song that everyone's looking for. But there's a lot of stuff sure. out there that I think, to your point, has really good good storytelling and really good music, and is really awesome to listen to. What about the live performance side of things? Is it easier to perform when you've written the music yourself and the story is is personally meaningful to you? 
to sing it and perform it as opposed to, say, performing someone else's song? Well, that's a great question. And uh, again, I think that the experience is slightly different between Ian and I because Ian and Eric write most of the music for Delta. I've just started dabbling in songwriting myself. Um, Ian and Eric have an, an amazing way of tapping in what's happening in my life and uh, incorporating stories that they know to be true of my life into their writing. Because we're so close and we talk about everything and they're right next to me uh, as I'm going through uh, things, it's kind of an, a process of osmosis where they're just absorbing the feelings and translating them into words. And for me, it's this beautiful synergy of people who I know to be the most honest and thoughtful uh, in my life, my brothers, taking stories, high experience, and distilling them into beautiful uh, lyrics and melody, and then gifting them to me to sing. It's like, it's an honor, and I love to sing the words that they've written. And the few times that I've sung songs that I've written, honestly, it's my level of anxiety <laughs> and the degree to which I feel um a little exposed is heightened because I also am facing the feeling of, is this good? Whereas when I'm singing my brother's words, the confidence that I've had in them since I was a little kid is there. That being so said, Brittany and Ian, who experienced snappy, uh, upbeat uh, breakup song? That was a little taste, I think, of both Liz and my love life. <laughs> gotten to be a heartbreaker um his uh, wife when he wrote that song i'm sure was sort of like what <laughs> knowing that uh liz and i were going through really tumultuous our first couple of years in north north carolina and uh <laughs> just uh, a little bit of drama Brittany. just a little just a little <laughs> yeah and you know the thing is like i mentioned i've known liz since we were each 11 years old and so you know we went through middle school together we went through high school together and some of these stories, you know, go way back. And I feel extremely grateful that uh, Brit and Liz are so um, open and also such uh, such an honor to put songs that we're writing um, in the hands of really great singers. So, Ian, uh, what instrument do you play, like a small guitar? It's, it's a ukulele, a tenor ukulele. And when did you start learning to play that? <laughs> I actually learned it um, exclusively uh, for If I Loved You. And uh, and can play no other song on it. Um, <laughs> we when we started working um, on a new version of that song with a producer named Rob Cavallo, we were kind of going back and forth, and he had brought in some great studio musicians that were throwing down ideas. And one of the things that came across early on was he got the big main rhythm played on a ukulele. We finally wound up in the studio with them in L.A., and um, we were meeting Rob for the first time in person, and. And he says, hey, has anybody told you about the uh, guests that we have on the track? And we were like, no. And he said, well, I don't know if you guys have heard of Fleetwood Mac. We all start uh, kind of letting go of our senses. And we've been covering Fleetwood Mac since the first day we started the band. And he said, wow. yeah, well, you know, Lindsay was, uh, was over the other day, Lindsay Buckingham of Fleetwood Mac. And, you know, I was playing him some of the stuff I'm working on, and he really liked your track, and he started playing this 12-string guitar, and... You know, I really liked what he was playing, so uh, I asked him to lay it down, and here it is. But I don't love you much as I want to. I don't love you, though. It would be a lie. You deserve love. You're better than a good thing I'm finding. But just not in my eyes, cause it ain't here, love. And that's the version of the song that we released a couple years ago. And so once Lindsay was on the track, I figured it was my obligation to learn how to play ukulele. And it has stayed, I can play that one song pretty well. It was one of the first songs that we ever wrote as a band. And then it has been on every recording that we've ever, every album we've ever released. So uh, <laughs> it is, uh, we're not breaking that streak because it will also be on our forthcoming record. 
So that's a little inside scoop. But it's one of those songs that we really believe in. And we're always trying to taste what, what best way uh, to bring it to life. And um, we think we nailed it with, with the one we've got right now that, that's yet to be released. Oh, that's fantastic. When when can we look forward to that happening? Great question. <laughs> don't really that's that's for, Tama. <laughs> for the release of the full-length album, we're, we're still planning that out. Hopefully, fourth time's the charm with If I Loved You. And then you're on a radio tour right now, so tell us about how that's going and, and where all you've been and where you hope to be soon here. Uh, the radio tour has been really exciting. We've never done anything quite like this before, and we feel really grateful uh, to be working with Valerie Music Company, and they've they've just done a, a really terrific job of taking care of us out on the road. But they've had us, you know, from Florida to Texas to California to Port- Boston. Bo- Boston and out to Seattle, and so we have uh, we have been literally all over the country. Uh, it has been extremely fast paced. We usually travel by van and trailer uh, when we're on our headlining tours. So this has been a new experience being on planes and doing everything a little bit differently, but it's been really exciting just to get in the room. It's just the four vocalists. We miss our, our drummer and bass player uh, doing this tour, but it's been really cool to reconnect, just stripping everything down to its most basic elements and getting to really listen to each other in each room, whether it's a conference room or a, a performance space and, there's something that feels really right about just kind of getting back to our roots and, you know, building out from there. Hey, Ian and Brittany, I just, I think this is a really super interesting question, not to load it on the front end, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> what is the one, what is the one thing that has surprised you most or the most interesting thing that you have learned with your travels about America, about the diversity of America from Florida to Seattle, from California to New York. It's just how big this country is and how different all the people are. What, what's like the single thing that has resonated with both of you about, about this journey? Well, uh, I can't speak for Ian, although I think he'll agree with me. Um, I think that my, my level of empathy over the last eight years with all of the traveling we've done has uh, been heightened in a huge way, meeting so many thousands of people. And I do think it was a huge surprise because you just can't anticipate the impact that strangers are going to have on your life. So we've traveled now for eight years. Um, We've been to almost all of the lower 48 states. And there's different cultures and accents and uh, demographics and in all different places. The, one of the big surprises is how much I love all of them um, for their for their uniqueness. So isn't it great? And we're all like one country. There is diversity that can be celebrated in the United States. I mean, we're all kind of different, but yet we're all under the same flag. It's just really amazing. Well, that's very much what I mean to say is we've got our differences and our cultural uniqueness in different places, but. The things that are the same are so deep, and they are so the same. People are going through really hard times no matter where you go, and when you're playing for them that you know comes from our hearts, it connects to them, and then they feel comfortable to share really intimate and personal stories, and, and that's been true of everywhere we've gone. So it just makes me look at the world in such a different way. I love America. I love our our natural landscapes. I love um, people's resourcefulness and goodness towards each other when we're really good towards each other. I I walk around these days now and just recognize that every person that I see is going through their own struggles and um, having met so many people and heard, you know, stories from them that if we were just strangers, sitting next to each other on the bus, I never would have heard. But because I was open and we were open as a band to play music that that was meant to open people's hearts and minds, I think that it works, and I think that it it certainly worked for us. That's so beautiful. Hey, if people want to learn more about Delta Ray, uh, see pictures, listen to music, find out where you'll be next, where can they find you? Well, we would love to connect with people, and they can find us. We're on all the social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. 
And our website is uh, DeltaRay.com, DeltaRae.com. And we have a mailing list that people can sign up for. I usually do a little bit more of a, a long-form insight into what's going on behind the scenes with Delta Ray on our mailing list. So people who sign up for that will get all of the pertinent information and a little bit more um, of our personal goings-on, which is always fun to share. And everyone in the band, we're completely in control of our social media. So we're in touch with everybody who reaches out. And uh, and we love to connect with people that way. So we'd love for people to, to stay connected with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Well, Brittany and Ian, thank you both so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your True North story with us. We look forward to hearing more great things from Delta Ray when your full album comes out and when we can see you again here in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you for listening to True North Story, the series. And tune in next time for another True North Story. Yeah.